Well, good morning. Did you say something in Spanish? Oh, thank you. I have a translator. Uh, Ray translated for me in Mexico uh, a couple years ago, I guess that was, and um, I'm not sure what I said, but he said it better, so that was, that's always a good thing about having translators with you. They can uh, correct, uh, kind of like autocorrect. So, I um, have still got, I've not now got three tools that people have provided for me to utilize in an upcoming sermon. Now, granted, sometimes I already have a sermon on track and then trying to find the right tool, so then I have to dig out from Brenda's toolbox, and that's what I have to do again. This is from uh, Brenda's collection of, uh, I don't know, antiques. So we were in England about uh, 20 years ago on a return trip. We'd already been stationed there and got invited to go back uh, to hear one of my uh, professors from Boston preach at Westminster Abbey, or Westminster Cathedral. And um, we went back to some of our old stomping grounds, went to an antique store in Ely, where Ely Cathedral is. It's a beautiful place. And we picked this up, which I really don't know what it is. So I'm going to make up my answer. You can, would you like to make up one? Uh, it's a what? A steam tray for a steam truck. I, I, steam trunk. I think that's a good, I think that is a good guess. I really do. I will accept that as, as a possible correct answer. However, it doesn't work in my sermon, so I just want you to know that. <laughs> Anybody else? Now that's working a little closer with the sermon, kind of like a sieve. Uh huh. Yeah, watch it. Bab just start dancing here. Do this too much. I know. Mike's got a, two pairs of shoes on, so I'm afraid Mike's going to start dancing any second. Well, it's interesting, you know, uh, coming in, someone said, and I won't say who it was, said, oh, it's a wine rack. I said, I'm not bringing a wine rack into a Baptist church because they'll be fighting over who gets it. Yeah. So I, I believe it could possibly have been something for gardening. That's kind of where Brendan and I thought it was. You know, you would throw in, may, maybe it's something to separate the produce from the dirt. You know, you could, I doubt you'd throw potatoes in it, but I guess you could shake it or maybe radishes, although a radish, unless it's a pretty big one, would fall through there. It would be something like that. And, you know, it would separate, well, I guess it could be, uh, but we can use all kinds with our imagination. It could be a grade of the produce because the smaller produce would fall through. My voice is still changing. And the larger ones would stay here. And, and I thought about that as I, well, I'll leave it set out here. Wouldn't it be great if there was a uh, device like that, some type of um, sieving or you know device to um, I don't know shift and and cause all the dirt, all the ugliness to come off of us. That if God could put us in here, something like this, He could shake it about. And as James says, let all the evil, let all the. He, I think he uses a couple other descriptive words according to whether you have King James or NIV about the nastiness of our lives and, and lay those aside. Um, and then he goes on to, to tell us that we should be doers of the word in the text that we'll be looking at today. Oh, but I need to point this out. Regardless of wh what, we bought it probably because it says this on the side, Perry Brothers. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where it went. So um, we'll be talking about how God works with his word to change us, to shake us up a little bit. And as we come back to James, we'll find that our faith can work like that sieve, which keeps our lives and keeps what's important up at top and let the other things fall to the side. But the book of James, I think we have this little test phrase we give that it is the test of the validity of our faith because a living faith is a working faith. And we started about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, today is the fourth sermon in this uh, passage, or the, this book of James. A faith that works will be tested. It was our first uh, sermon. Second one was a faith that works comes from God. Uh, last week we talked about that a faith that works levels temptation. Not that you don't have it, but it levels it. And then today I want us to consider that a faith that works is rooted in the word. Now, I am not, um, what's that word? Superstitious. I'm not superstitious, but I am rooted in tradition. And Norris and I have had a tradition for a year of praying together 
And he was out here. I thought you were in Sunday school this morning, Norris. And I kept waiting for you to come up in my office and pray. So um, let's just pray with Norris's presence because that's, that's kind of been my, uh, I don't know, my pre-game, uh, pre-sermon send-off. So let's pray as we look at this text. And, and Norris, I apologize that I didn't get out here and pray right beside you, but we're praying together now. Lord, I thank you for this text that uh, is familiar to us. It is so familiar to us that sometimes we let it slip right through the holes like this sieve right here today. We fail to see the produce of your word. So today I pray as we look at this text that we would see that a living faith is truly rooted in your word. And we'll talk about mirrors and we'll talk about other things, Lord, about being a doer of the word. But right now, Lord, I pray that we'd be listeners, not to my words, but to your words. Your holy words that James wrote for us so many years ago. Speak to us in this hour, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First off, hear the word. Hear the word. Look at verses 19 through 20 one more time. Well, I haven't even read them to you. Let me read them to you first. I said so much of it in the prayer. I, I know you're familiar with this. I'll read it for you. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Man, highlight that in your, in your Bibles. Your anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Amen. So, as I said, first point this morning, hear the word. Now, I've read that mothers can recognize the sound of their infant's voice, even in a room of other crying babies. I won't challenge any of the ladies. They're shaking their heads. Okay. Well, I know that you can take your car to a good mechanic, and just by listening to the engine, he can tell you or she can tell you what's wrong or right about it. And I do know from personal experience that doctors have taken a stethoscope and put it somewhere either on my front of my chest or, uh, or in the back, and they, they've told me what's good and bad about my heart and my lungs. So obviously you can train your ear to hear particular things, right? So Christians should be training their ear to hear the Word of God. Sadly, there's a lot of hard of hearing Christians out there. I know I'm getting hard of hearing because I'm 62 and probably too much rock and roll back in the day, right? Turn the stereo up too loud. Maybe I, I, didn't work in the, I didn't work on the flight line. I did go around the flight line, but there are a lot of reasons you can lose your hearing. But there's a, probably a number of excuses why we say we can't hear the Word of God. Well, you see, I'm convinced that as we look at this passage, we are quick to speak. We're like missiles going into anger, and we're really, really never, ever listening. But surely a Christian can tra train his hearing. I think he can. Uh, even with conversations with good friends, how many of you have found yourself, you know, you're talking, and I'm looking at different people here that I've had lots of conversations with over the years I've been here, drinking coffee or whatever, and sometimes that person's talking, but you've already shut them down because you've got a story you've got to get out. You know, and, and of course, the older you get, you forget those stories. You've got a lot of them, but there's so many of them, and they're popping around. And, and somebody's talking to you, but you've already shut them down. You're not listening to them because you've got to tell your story. 
James says. In fact, he writes, with love, my dear brothers, beloved, I think King James says. NIV um, says, uh, take note, but the New American Standard says, you see. Open your eyes, one commentator I read this week said. It's like the elbow that your wife or your husband gives you when you've dozed off in church. Wake up to what I'm about to say. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Does that sound familiar at all to you? Once again, reminding you of the writer of this book. James is the, bro is the brother of Jesus. Um, and if you go into the book of Matthew, I think the seventh chapter, you will find this on verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He's telling us to listen, to hear the word. James will go on in verse 21 to say that the word must be planted in us. That which saves us. A faith that is rooted, planted in the word is a working faith. A faith that works. But we get angry. Instead of listening, we get mad. We say things in the heat of the moment that cause us to fall out of the righteous life that God is intending for us to live. In verse 20, you see that. Anybody here ever get angry? Well, there are some honest people in here. The rest of you, yeah. You, oh, I, sorry, I didn't get my hand up fast enough, yeah. Garrett Kiesler is a um, Episcopal priest, a former Episcopal priest. I think he's retired now. Uh, he wrote a book called The uh, Enigma of Anger. I stumbled on it this week as I was trying to think more about anger and what makes me angry. In fact, he thought it was funny, not funny, it's, it's, I guess it's a, ironic is the right word, that a faith that encourages us meekness and humility can be so full of hang, anger in worship and in church polity and many other things. He tells us, and I quote, Rage, resentment, envy, jealousy, and hatred, these emotions seem to dominate our times. They rule our highways. Road rage. They rule our workplaces. There's a lot of workplace rage. Our homes and our hearts. We must identify, he says, the trigger points for our anger and then let them slip through the holes of our sieve onto the ground. Proverbs 17, 27, and 28. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even tempered. This is this uh, dual teaching of, of rabbis of the day that uh, silence and wisdom often go hand in hand. In fact, that's why most of us know the next verse. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Well, each of us need to identify what those trigger points are in our lives for anger. Because once you're mad, you say things that you wish you'd never said. And then you never listen. Have you ever been in an argument where you're so mad at the other person and you're shouting or you're, I mean, not that I ever have, a, but you, you're shouting and, you know, the spit is coming out of your mouth and you're so blood, your know, blood is all boiling and they finally get through your anger and they can speak over your loudness and you hear that maybe you're mad about something that really didn't even happen. Sometimes that happens with our kids and it's so embarrassing. It's so humbling to think... I got mad at you, probably because something else is bothering me. Identify those trigger points and let them slip through the holes. Here's a video clip I'm going to play for you in just a second. It's one of my favorite movies, probably because I think it's like the next to last movie my dad and I ever went to a theater together to see. And my dad was an avid 
gambler on the horses. He loved to watch the horses run. He would say, I would watch them run even if I didn't have a bet placed. But this is Seabiscuit, uh, the story of the little horse that uh, raced uh, the war, uh, war admiral, or yeah, when I think that's his name, uh, in 1938. And um, Spider-Man plays red. This is all based on true stuff. And uh, he has been, thanks to the Depression, Red, the, the jockey you'll see, uh, is really angry all the time. And part of it is due to the fact that his parents had to abandon him because of the Depression. They couldn't afford to feed all the kids, so they basically gave him to another family. And then he got passed around and became almost uh, really an orphan at that point. So here we see him in a race, one of his first races with Seabiscuit. Sahib, kind of small, isn't he? Gonna look a lot smaller in a second, Georgie. He got five bucks, says he doesn't. thinking he fouled me what am i supposed to do let him get away with that well yeah when he's 40 to 1 he almost put me in the rail well did he look we had a plan he fouled me tom what am i supposed to do he cut me off he fouled me son son what are you so mad at We have to ask ourselves that same question. What are we so mad at? People who shoot each other in traffic, what are you so mad at? It, it, it's not the fact that somebody cut you off for the moment. There's something deeper that is causing the irritation that has now surfaced often behind the wheel. So what are the things that make you mad? What are the things that produce anger in your heart and, and destroy relationships? Often it is the things that we feel that have hurt us in some way. A, a, a derogatory remark. Something that has embarrassed you, you get angry. Something you feel has been taken away from you. Something that has compromised your importance in the world, or at least your self-perceived importance. Or perhaps somehow someone's broken one of your standards of living that you feel the need to be the legal arm to change that person's standard. Well, James calls us to live for him. And when we do that, you will watch that anger fall through the hose of that sieve. Because, of course, uncontrolled anger leads to uncontrolled speed of speech. And with our tongues, we burn through our relationships. Identify this morning the triggers of your anger and let God sift them through these holes. And fill you with his righteousness. Slow down and listen. Think of God before you speak. And let go of your anger 
so you can get a grip on his word. And that's the second point. Get a grip. Grip of the word. Grip the word. Verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. I love the King James. Yeah, you got it up early. That's okay. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and super, superfluity. That's a word I don't ever use. I had to look it up. It means excess. It can mean excess even in luxurious living, but it means an amount more than what you would normally need. That superfluity of naughtiness and receive naughtiness. I mean, that's interesting. That's in King James. I just don't think of the 1600s saying naughtiness. And receive with meekness. Now that one you does. The engrafted, I like that, engrafted word. You know, I, I, you've heard me say my uncle uh, was an, uh, an orchard manager for 40 years. And when you graft one tree to another tree, you can change the product of what that tree is. You can... I don't think he ever took a Johnson and a Red Delicious, but you take those two, and eventually you can make a different variation of an apple. So if you engraft the Word of God, uh, NIV says plant it, I believe, yeah. If you plant the Word of God in you, what changes will transpire is that which is able to save your soul. The word he uses, there, wherefore lay apart, and what NIV says, get rid of, is the word which merely means to strip off. Take it off. Rid yourselves of the moral filth. What is moral filth or superfluity of uh, naughtiness? Well, it is um, camouflaged in our society, is it not? Moral filth, we walk by every day. Because we've become accustomed to it. Oh, sometimes you can see it in others, but you don't see it in yourself. And if you simply define the word moral as ability to determine what is right and wrong, and I think most of us know that filth is that thing which is dirty, foul, disgusting, or unclean. And when you put them together, moral filth is that which God sees, but the world perhaps is blind to. James says, get rid of it. Strip it off. Take it off. Sift it out. And then enter verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. King James, you got to love it. But be ye... Come on, you guys memorize this. I think when some of you did. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. And then he illustrates it with the mirror. Believe it or not, I've used a mirror in church before. And this is from, a, I think, a children's sermon. Because this is one of those that is, you know, oh, wow, I don't like to look at it that way because you're really up close. But he says that the person who reads the Word of God is like a person who looks at a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. Now, typically, the reason you look in a mirror is to what? Fix your hair? See if you got something in your teeth? You know, do I need to shave? Have the eyebrows gone, you know, like in 50 different directions? There's something hanging from the nostrils? Now, if you've done that, will you take corrective action? Sure. Unless you're some of the teenagers I've seen. They've seen their hair and they go, well, it looks good. And you would have thought you should have combed that. But typically, when you see something wrong in the mirror, you know to fix it. To apply corrective action. And that's what James is saying. Some people who don't do that are like the guy who looks in the mirror and walks away from it. And basically has never applied the word of God. So remember that you need to spend enough time in the word of God that it begins to change you. Or at least you see the need to comb the hair, if you will, of your life. Put things in order. One commentator I read this week says that uh, what Paul is writing here, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He calls it moral Alzheimer's. A kind of deep forgetfulness 
that leaves the religious self unable to function fully. We are to grip the word. Let it be grafted, implanted, rooted in our lives. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When the word of God takes root in your life, you will start looking more like Jesus. Now, side note, this just happened yesterday. We had cars and coffee, and I'm telling uh, my, one of my sons and, and one of his friends my church jokes. I, I got a ton of them, you know. What kind of lights they have on the ark? Floodlights. Ha, ha, ha. You know. What's the profession of the wise men? Firemen. They come from afar. Ha, ha, ha. So finally I come to my car one, the only car one. There's a motorcycle one I know and a car one. What kind of car did Jesus have? He said, well, I had an accord because all the disciples were in one accord. And about that time, a Honda goes driving by, and there's a guy with a deep, dark beard and long hair. And when the, the Nick's friend says, well, there goes Jesus. <laughs> and I don't mean you're going to start having your hair grow long and your beard come out and, and look like Jesus in a physical way, but you will look more like Jesus in the way that you live and conduct yourself and behave. Because we must be careful, James says, that you don't deceive yourself. Don't be self-deceiving. Listening doesn't necessarily mean change. I've told you before, I had the chaplain assistant who I would tell him to do something, and he would say, Roger that, sir. Forgive me, Troy, he was a former cop. He'd say, Roger that, sir. Roger that, sir. And he would never do it. And finally, one day I told him, Roger ain't going to do that. You got to do that. So listening does not necessarily mean bring about change. It doesn't necessarily bring about transformation. It means taking it and applying it and doing it. I asked Dan this morning, I brought in more children's sermon illustrations. I'm ready to start doing children's sermons someday. We may have to do them, you know, social distance. But <clears throat> I said, Dan, where do you live? Where'd you grow up? And he told me, and at first I, I was thinking of Wade because I knew you'd be here on the front. And he, he said, uh, I knew you're from St. Louis originally, but of course, Dan, now it's in there and I can't find it. It's one of them funky words you told me how to spell it. Dan, tell me how to spell it again. Uh, there it is, Meridosa, Illinois. Meridosia, Illinois. See, I'm a, I'm a southerner in Illinois. You're a Yankee, Illinois. There's a difference. So it's not very southern, Illinois, but most of you, if you've got a smartphone, you have Google Apps on it, right? There are a Google Map or something like that, or you have some other kind of maybe a Apple Maps or whatever. So I hit... Uh, Dan's hometown, and I'm going to do from right here my location, and it tells me to Dan's hometown uh, is uh, 15 hours and 53 minutes, 982 miles, and I'm going to hit start. Now, it's talking to me, but I ain't listening. Furthermore, I'm not moving, so I can put the destination in the phone and never get there. You can have a road map of how to live and how to seek God's grace and how to have a faith that works. But if you never apply it, if you never take the first step on the journey, if you never use the map that God has provided you, you're going to end up in the same place you started, perhaps even going in the wrong direction. In the same way, you may have a Bible app on your phone. You may get an emailed scripture every day or some kind of devotional. But the words on that screen or the words on this page or that Google map will not take you there, change your life, unless you read those words and heed those words and get a grip on the words to allow you to go where God wants you to go. Now, I put my hands like this, and Mark is a golfer, and I know we've got some other golfers here. Uh, the Zunigas are golfers. I don't know if I, I don't see them here today, but... Um, Golfing, I'm told, what little I do know, which is not much, uh, I have a set of clubs. That makes me a real golfer. Um, a lot of it begins with the grip and the way you hold uh, the, the, I started to say the stick. That's, that's pool. I was going to say the iron, the club, the driver, whatever. The way you hold it will then determine the direction of that ball. Right? Well, that and maybe a talented swing as you do it. 
But the same way, the, the grip you have on the Word of God will determine where you go. So grip the Word. And finally, spread the Word. Spread the Word. Verse 25. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, because if you remember, the mirror has been somewhat his symbol or his illustration, but now if you look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to, continues to do this, that's being a doer, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The word that is translated looks intently is the same word that was used when Peter ran and had to stoop down and look into the open tomb of the resurrection Sunday. It's the same word that is used for John when he has to look intently. And for Mary Magdalene, in two different gospel accounts, the same word of looking intently into that which perhaps was not expected or certainly hard to comprehend at first glance. They were amazed. They were taking in the miracle of the resurrection. James tells us that the one who will look intently stoops down and gazes on the word of God. And once he has done that, he will spread the word of God as a doer of the word, and he will be blessed. Now, most of us know the term a narcissist, right? That's a person who likes himself better than anybody else, as you will. It, it comes from Greek mythology, Narcissus, who was a hunter in Greek mythology and was known to be the best looking guy around. Now, I'm going to make it into modern day terms. He, I mean, he was so good looking, he couldn't find anybody to date because he, he reserved himself for the best looking person and he couldn't find any better looking than himself. So in the Greek myth of Narcissus, he, he is led to a pool of water and he's thirsty and he gets ready to take a drink and he looks into the water and he sees the most handsome, beautiful person he's ever seen. And he bends over and he gets closer and he sees how beautiful this person is and he tries to kiss that person and, and the image goes away. Obviously, he was trying to kiss himself in the pool of water. And he pulled his head up and waited, you know, for it to calm down. And he sees himself again. And once again, he puts his head in the water trying to kiss himself. And as the myth goes, he died by that water. Trying to embrace and love himself. Christ does tell us to love ourselves as we love or love one another as we love ourselves. So if you can have love for one another, like you love yourself, think how the world would change. Spread the word. He doesn't tell us to remain staring back at the word, but to go spread the word. To go what, and take what we have learned from it and be changed by it and help others to be inspired by it. And to go forward with their map to be able to withstand the directions that they have given so that they will be able to love one another. That they will be able to forgive. That they will understand what mercy is. That they will understand how it is to give as we have received. How it is to help. How it is to share. How it is to be mobilized. To have a faith that works because it's rooted in the word. A faith that works is rooted in God's word. Stand with me, please, we pray. Our Father, many of us at times have looked more at ourselves than anybody else. We look more at ourselves than we look at you. Have us consider how much time we spend in the mirror or prepping ourselves compared to our prayer time. How much time we spend entertaining ourselves with articles or books or periodicals that tickle our fancies compared to the time we spend in your word. If we want a faith that works, Lord, we must, we must be rooted in your word. And like this sieve beside me, I pray, Lord, that you would hold us in your hands and let the things, the evil filth of the world, the, the morality that troubles or doesn't trouble our world, but troubles you, that we would find 
how to live the righteous life that you have called us to live. So challenge us this day to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to be angry. For Lord, we read this passage and we want the blessing that comes from knowing you that James promises us if we'll only be doers of the word. If there's someone in this moment that has never accepted Jesus as their Savior, I pray that this would be the day. If they've perhaps let too much of the world's filth bog them down, let them come to this time of invitation and say, I'll leave it all behind. Lord, sift me. Try me. And Lord, maybe there's someone here who wants to come and join this church. Whatever decision there is to make, Lord, I pray that you would lead by your Holy Spirit, your people, to respond. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.